read the whole thing. Yeah. You're supposed to set the bar low. That's part of uh, what it takes. <laughs> um, man, I'm just on uh, I'm the MC and then moderating elders, now youth. And you guys will be just sick of me by the end of it. But uh, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna just share. We don't have uh, PowerPoint. We're gonna do this uh, through oral tradition. We're gonna do it the best way that we know how. Uh, we want to share with you just a little bit about why what we do and how we do it and the reasons why we do this work, and uh, just some of the movement forward. So part of what uh, part of what we uh, do. Who in here is familiar with ITEP? Just a show of hands. All right. So. If you throw a rock in a group of Indians, you're going to hit an ITEPER somewhere along the way. So this is proof of that. So the ITEP program is the Indian Teacher Education Program. And uh, within North America, uh, like United States and Canada, uh, we are the longest running uh, and, and the largest alumni base for First Nation teachers, Indian teachers in the United States. Uh, our program has been uh, started in 1972 and our main goal was founded off of uh, uh, the 1969 white paper from that old Trudeau, you know, the, the, that old guy there that we, uh, this new guy's dad. It started off as white paper that, you know, was put in place to uh, assimilate us, to eradicate our rights and, our, and eradicate us into uh, uh, minority citizens within Canada. And we can go into that whole political speech, and we already heard from Perry this morning who alluded to that. But we came together, what that did was that it sparked people to start thinking collectively about moving forward and revitalizing language, culture, and traditions. And one of those pieces in, in that revitalization, and there are people in this room that were actively involved in a lot of that work. Uh, you know, Mahina in the back over there is uh, actively involved in indigenous education for a long time. And when we talk about these, um, these movements, one of those founding documents that was presented at that time was the red paper. So we combated the white paper, you know, and I, when I was growing up, the white paper, I just thought, you know, white people made that, so it's called the white paper. That's like, <laughs> I later found out that when you put legislation forward, you know, they're all called white paper. Just killed the whole, you know, I was mad because they're racist, but they weren't really, it's just what they call stuff. Yeah. Anyways, but, but, I mean, Canada is racist, you know, that's just a reality. But, um, and he, everybody's, yeah, I know, supposed, supposed to be laughing a little bit, you know. Um, but we have, uh, we have put forward this spark that started this fire in this red paper. And part of what happened in there was the chapter of Indian control. And we talk about Indian control, we talk about Rodney Sunyas, we talk about these, these men that were leading this time and Harold Cardinal. But really the foundation of what, uh, sparked that and what maintained it and the strength behind it were those grandmothers that pitched up the canvas tents on, on blue quills on the yard of it and took back that residential school and created this indigenous inclusion uh, environment. It was the foundation of moving forward for all of us across this country and into the United States, sparking uh, different pieces of this, uh, uh, this work in uh, the Indian survival school movement sparking uh, a lot of stuff that was, again, foundationally built off people being fired up, wearing red bandanas and bone chokers, you know, looking real deadly Hollywood, you know, fancy uh, uh, Billy Jack hats, you know, where all of a sudden we're being proud to be Indian again. And it was okay to do that. But there was a shroud and a, and a shadow that was looming over us. And that shroud and shadow was this education system. The education system, uh, those of us in here, uh, just a show of hands if you work within that K-12 school, K-12 school systems. So those of us that work within these school systems that are indigenous, that are Indian, we have to come to the reality that number one, these schools and these systems, they're not ours. They never were ours. They were created at the intention when they first started for old white men to succeed. They weren't even created for white women to succeed. You know, they were created for that system. And they were that education system that we use and that we utilize, that was a tool meant to kill us. Now, 
When I first went to uh, school, I went to school in a place called La Verandre, uh, uh Elementary School. And in La Verandre Elementary School in Portersville Prairie, Manitoba, where I, where, I, where I was first growing up in this place, they taught me that John A. Macdonald was a hero and the first Prime Minister of Canada and a founding father of Confederation. And that this is somebody that we should uplift as, as Canadians living within this country. Later on in my life and growing up and then going to school in our First Nation communities in Palmaker, Saskatchewan, I learned that John A. Macdonald was actually an asshole. You know, and part of being an asshole, I'm sorry if there's kids in here, my Bronte, where's my little bro? Yeah, you don't ever say asshole, only I can say that. Okay? You know, so part of, part of what happened in this situation and in, in, in this uh, re realization is that I came to understand that he was wanting to eradicate us and kill us. And the tool that he used was education. Because education is a very, very powerful way to influence uh, people. And not only did he, uh, did he create this, uh, uh, this tool meant to kill the Indian and the child, not only did he pass the legislations and pass off the responsibilities to people, but they were damn good at it. And, our, and what we have as an example of that effect and what we have as an example of that, of that uh, difficulty is that um, growing up in my home, my home, like uh, uh, my home and being raised by my grandmother, the only time that we ever spoke our language in my home was when we were praying. And she had a difficult time sharing her language as she would talk outside of that. And that was our Nakota language. And then for my father, who grew up fluent, Swampy Cree speaker from Norway House, who used to interpret, it, interpret uh, stories and things that my grandfather would want to my grandmother in Norway House as in a Cree language, he had a difficult time because of his experience in the education system as well. So this difficult, you know, piece that we have, we all know it. It's a story that's not unfamiliar to us. It's a story that's the reality. So in 1972, we were lucky with the teachers that came in that wanted to be trained. We had Indians that we had to train to be classroom teachers. So people that were fluent in their language still, still actively participating in culture that were fueled with this revitalization for identity, culture, and language, they were coming into higher levels of education so that they can go teach in Blue Quills, so that they can go teach in Joe Dequette, these Indian survival schools and, and these schools in our reserves, these day schools. They were there to train them so that they can stand in front of Indian children and Indian people would teach culture, language, and tradition, as well as understand and know this Western world that we have to live in and, and be in. Now, for me, I stepped into this role for the Indian Teacher Education Program, which graduates between 70 and uh, uh, 60 and 100 student teachers per year. First Nation teachers. And, in, and in 20 years ago, 80% of them would be fluent speakers. Today, it's less than 10%, uh, less, uh, less than that. Even that's being generous. So 90% of the teachers that I'm producing through my program don't speak their language. They are having a difficult time connecting. So what we had to come to the truth bomb realization is, is that we now had to change our students that are entering our program. We had to fuel them to be Indian, then train them to be teachers. If that makes any sense, and that's difficult because everybody comes to our program. Our Dene relatives come there, our Soto relatives come there, our DNL relatives come there, and our Cree relatives come there. And all of those different groups, they all have different dialects. And if you ever had an opportunity to sit with a group of Nakota people talking about language revitalization, You'll get in a room and they'll argue over a dictionary for three and a half days. <laughs> and we actually won't even get any anywhere, you know, because we're arguing over dialects. I mean, okay, uh, excuse me, 
But uh, every time that we argue over which dictionary we're using, my kid doesn't know another word in our language. So we just have to speak it. We just have to offer opportunities, like Simon said this morning. So this brings us to why we're all sitting in here, is that I try my best to be a leader that thinks forward, that wants to move forward in the best way possible. And I was raised around old people. Um, you know, I, always, I get home, you know, and sometimes I'm just wishing for tripe soup, you know, and, and everybody in my home that's young or anybody that's my age, they're like, gross, that's disgusting. I'm like, heck no, man. Give me some taniga, let's do this, you know. But they're not into it. Liver and onions, you know, cow tongue, you know, all of these real, you know, these foods we got from the butcher that were cheap that the butcher threw away. That's what I grew up on. And we sat around and visited in Fort Belknap, in Carry the Kettle, in Ocean Man. We visited in, in, in Fort Peck and all of these different places. And I was the runner. I'd go and get tea and coffee. I'd go and get uh, Nevadas. You know, they used to sell Nevadas. You're just selling Nevadas to a, you know, a six-year-old. That's wrong, man. Anyways. Bronte, go get me a, a Nevada. I used to, on a side note, I used to get a note, you know, from my grandma. Chris is going to pick me up a pack of Demorier. He used to go to the store, you know, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, picking up smokes, you know, real rank. Anyways, that's, that's a side. I kind of go off a little bit. So this brings us into this reality, trying to think forward and trying to think ahead of what we can do. So we run this very important program with the foundation of Indian control to incorporate language, culture, and tradition, as well as understand the curriculum, as well as making sure that people know and understand that we live in this world. We hear this, world, this word called uh, decolonization. And decolonization is returning back to our old way, returning back to that. And if that were to happen, if I were to 100% decolonize, I would starve. My family would starve. You know, I'd be, I wouldn't look as round, you know. And I would say this, you know, like, I'm up here feeling chubby, you know. But uh, at one time, this was like a sexy machine, you know. It was, a, you know, it was in good shape at one time, you know. I, just, I always put that, you know, disclaimer in there, you know, that I, at one time this was all right, you know. Anyways. Now they're like, how much did he have for some lunch? <laughs> Anyways, we'll go back, I'm going off track. But we had, we had to think about forward thinking about existing in this world. We can't 100% decolonize. That's, a, that's an impossible dream. But what we can do, and the, and the mindset and, the, and how I think, is that we allow our children to be more Indian than we had growing up. That's all we do. We allow our children, we allow our grandchildren to be more indigenous than we had growing up. We allow them to have more opportunities to hear language. We have, allow them to have more opportunities to speak language, to participate in ceremony, to just engage and be a part of being what it means to be indigenous to our different language groups. We, that is our goal. That is the ultimate goal for us. And we instill that in our children so that when they get older, that they're praying and they're saying the things in the language that was meant to us and given to us by the Creator. That is the, that is the ultimate goal of how, how I think when I'm trying to think about how we do this for our, for our people. Now, we produce teachers. So we produce teachers that stand in front of a classroom. They get a degree from the University of Saskatchewan and it says... You know, Rhonda Bear, Bachelor of Education degree, University of Saskatchewan. That gives them the Saskatchewan legal right to stand in front of a class and to teach children. But we're Indians. We're Indian first. So how do we validate and how do we provide knowledge to our students so that they can stand in front of a classroom and incorporate the knowledge system that's in place for them? It's hard, it's difficult. There's, we're n no one's ever going to agree in this room on how to do it properly. If we think about 
I grew up in, in a Plains Cree, uh, uh, Plains Cree area and a Plains Cree um, uh, community called Poundmaker. I'm a band custom member of this band. I'm also an, an adopted into the Tatusis family. My, my, my adopted parents are Edwin and Millie Tatusis. And the Tatusis family were fluent Cree speakers. My dad is a fluent, uh, my adopted dad is a fluent Plains Cree speaker. And the difficulty in that is that we adopt these mentalities of how we teach and it's not conducive to how we were before residential schools. Which makes it difficult for us to learn as we're going through and we only pick it up as we know or as we hear. So one of the things that happened um, for me is studying our language as we go through. Studying the meanings of it. Uh, we use that term, mamu um, utawema, uh, and when we're praying, right? And I, and I thought about that word, you know, what does that word mean, you know? What does it actually mean, like in literal translation, you know? Our father, everybody's father, who influences that? Why do we name it that? Why is it called that? It's called that because that's how we refer to the Creator in our churches. You know, and when I, when I realize this, I'm like, holy smokes, you know, like there's so many teachings that are just in that simple word and how we're doing these things. So, what we did was we, try, we we've tried our best. I take the, uh, the understanding and the belief that we move forward in the best way possible that we allow our children to be more Indian than we had growing up, and we incorporate the ways forward as best we can. Now, in a university setting, if you are familiar with any Western in institution, you'll understand how difficult it is to be indigenous in those spaces. It's not easy. And if you don't have a program like ITEP that's been around for 47 years, good luck because it is not a friendly place for most times. We're getting better, but it's still not a friendly place. To, to tell you how unfriendly it is to Indians. In ITEP, because we have a bubble, because all of our staff are indigenous, because all of our staff are First Nation, we create a bubble that we support our students. 90% of the students that start our program in ITEP finish it. This is a university program. Just down the road in the next college over, First Nation students that enter that college, only 10% of them are successful. Because our institutions are not accommodating to our indigenous ways of knowing. We need to see ourselves in this education, we need to see ourselves in how we act and how we interact. So what we've done is we've created professional development to not solve all the problems and make every teacher a super Indian and they know everything from every language group, that's not the intent of our PDs. The intent of our PDs is to start a spark, to know that when they enter a community there's a way and process to access knowledge, and there's also the understanding that you don't only hear one language, you hear all of them. So. Those of us that are in here, that are teachers, at some point in time, if you were, if you were Nakota maybe, perhaps, that you taught in a Cree community. You know, if you're Nakota and you snag some Cree, Cree guy and all of a sudden, you know, I'm gonna work in Beardies. That's my favorite place, you know. <laughs> you have to understand the traditions of that community. So our teachers that are coming into these programs, they have to understand how to interact and be a part of that community. Because those are the children that we're serving in that, in that scenario. And vice versa. If the, uh, only, only smart Cree women do this, but if these Cree women snag Nakota guys from Kerry to Kettle, you know, only smart ones do that, yeah? My wife's from Moon Lake. So anyways. <laughs> They have to understand, and they're teaching in Kerry to Kettle, they need to understand the Nakota traditions of the people there. So we can't be only one group centric in our education systems. 
We can't only be Cree-centric because that's easiest. We have to try to figure out how we incorporate all the different knowledge systems in there, which is a huge task and it's difficult. But we came up with some plans and some ways forward. So one of the, I wish I could take credit for all of this, you know, I'd be a rich man, you know, probably or whatever, but I can't take credit for it. I am lucky that I work with strong indigenous women. And everybody offers tools that we want to move forward. And everybody understands that we're servants. We're servants to the students in the, in the K-12 system. We're stu servants to the students that are in the ITEP program. And because we serve them, we work for them. We try to figure out ways to make them the best that we can. So part of this work falls on the shoulders of the staff that I work with. So this particular work here that we're gathered here that we're going to talk about, that I'm going to stop talking and let someone else talk, fell on the shoulders of, of Mika Lafon. And this honestly would not have happened in how we've done it this year without Mika and the work that she's done in this. And a lot of, I mean, too many times, too many, the, the, the men get the credit for all of this. It's a small piece of work that I, I, I write a check from, uh, from Think Indigenous and I pay the people. But that the work that went forward and the building it up and, and the conversations and making it happen and making it move forward, a lot of that was done by the staff that do this work. So I want to let, uh, let Mika talk a little bit about the actual program. So it's easy to talk about things. Like anybody can sound deadly and talk and, you know, get up here and just like, you know, oh man, that's so awesome. And then all of a sudden, they don't even ever do any work. You know, it just sounds good. This is, <laughs> this is actually happening. Like, we're actually doing it. I'm not lying. You know, honest. <laughs> honest. Yeah, we, we're really doing it. So we are actually doing this work. And nothing's perfect. We figure out how we move forward. Uh, we, we learn from our mistakes. And then we continue on. So I just want to, uh, I just want to invite Mika up. Uh, just to talk now about about our program and how and what it is and what it looks like. All right, go ahead. Hello, um, I'm from Muskeg Lake. Is this working? Is this okay. um, I grew up there, and. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about my experience in school as a student um, and then how that kind of drives me for the work that I'm doing at ITEP. So um, the first four years of elementary school, um, I went to a provincial school and then in 1991, Muskeg um, started their, their school, their reserve run school. And I was in grade five. Now I can go a little bit. <clears throat> so, um, up until then, there was one indigenous teacher in the school, and she was our Cree teacher. Um, so I had, that's pretty much the only access I had to my language at that time. Um, and then when Muskeg took over the school, uh, they implemented a whole bunch of um, culture and language programming for the students there. And so we had ceremony on Mondays and Fridays. Um, to open our week and to kind of close off for the weekend and then we'd start again on Monday. Uh, they also had a one afternoon every month for us that was land-based um, learning with the language. And then we, we had um, Cree, we still had our Cree language class every single day. And we also, um, we also learned other um, skills from our Cree teacher who was Gladys Wapas Gray Eyes. Um, some of you may know who she is. So she, she worked in, in Muskeg as the Cree language teacher and the culture teacher. Um, when, I, when I got to grade nine, so Muskeg school only ran up to grade nine. When I got to grade nine and completed it, I had to move to the town school um, 
and it was a provincial school and when I got there I was completely lost I felt really lost there was none of there was no more um, smudging and there was no more Cree language and there wasn't you know Cree all over the school we had in in Muskeg school we had Cree everywhere up on the walls on the posters um, we were creating things with our language and um, when I got to the town school I was really lost and it didn't feel the same I guess uh, and so <laughs> I got really, really lost, and I uh, dropped out of school in grade 11. I just didn't want to be there. It didn't feel good. It wasn't a positive place for me. I could do the work, but I just didn't want to be there. In town, all of the kids who were bussed in from the reserve were bad. So um, we were just labeled bad. We were troublemakers. So if we went downtown at lunchtime, you know, everybody was watching every little move that we made. So it just didn't feel good, so I just quit. <coughs> And I didn't know how to explain that to anybody when I was uh, 16 years old. I ended up finishing grade 12 here in the city at Mount Royal. Um, when I went to Mount Royal, they had uh, the daycare and they had some indigenous teachers there and they had some programming and so it felt like home again, uh, even though I was far away from home. And then um, I did really well there and I went to university and I wasn't, wasn't in the right place and I failed miserably. And then I found ITEP. And when I found ITEP, I, it, everything just took off for me. And uh, when I started ITEP, I was a minority I, because I'm not, a, I'm not fluent in my language. Um, but when I went to ITEP, I was a minority in the classroom. Everyone, pretty much everyone in my classroom was a speaker, um, and when we would, you know, have our breaks and we'd be standing around, they would all be speaking Cree, and then they'd go, oh yeah, Mika doesn't understand, so then they'd be translating for me. Um, then I, uh, when I graduated ITEP, I went back to the high school that I had dropped out of, and I taught there. And I was the only Indigenous staff member on staff there, and they gave me a program to develop. Uh, it was called the Kitwan program. And they basically gave me all the freedom in the world to develop that program. And it was the, the uh, Prairie Spirit School Division that was, that was uh, running that school. So I had students from Mississauga and Muskeg who were, um, they had been labeled as at-risk learners or um, they had dropped out of school and it was my my job, I was assigned to re-engage the students through the Keep On program. And so when I developed that program, we didn't spend any time in the classroom for the first two years. I took them to uh, a farm by PA once a week for the first couple of months, and we did um, horse therapy with them. So I brought horses into their lives. Um, we cooked meals in the community health clinic in Mistawasis for the community staff. And I helped them kind of start to feel like they were a part of their community and um, get to know some of the older generation. And so there, it, there was a lot of intergenerational learning going on. Um, I brought language into the classroom for them as much as possible that I was capable of doing, but then I also um, brought elders into the activity so that they could have uh, more access to, to more language than I was able to bring. So I did all of that with them, and these were students who were attending maybe three days a month of high school. Um, I had one student <coughs> who started with me, he had one credit in grade 10, and he was already uh, 18, so he had already been in high school for about three years, and he had one credit, which meant that he, out of the possibility of having 24, he had only class. Um, I connected with him. I uh, got him to come, start coming to school just by using basketball because he liked playing basketball. Um, he he loved the horse. Um, the horse therapy, and uh, I found out that 
his grandfather and grandmother in Mr. Wallace's, um, they were ceremonial leaders and he was very active and he was missing school actually because he was helping them. He was, um, he was uh, taking trips with them, driving them to, to get where they needed to go, uh, to get the things that they needed for their ceremonies at home. So um, when I found that out, all of his assignments became more, about, uh, more based on that knowledge that he had from his, his mushroom and his cookum. And as soon as I did that, he started writing for me. And, uh, and he started being, being able to complete assignments because he could relate what the technical, you know, provincial curriculum was asking him to talk about, but he was relating it to his own, like his, his own land knowledge that he had, which is super valuable. So you can talk about geology and rocks, and you can use all the technical terms in science. And uh, he he knew how to pick rocks for sweat, and he knew all the characteristics of rocks, but he didn't know the technical terms. So then all that he had to do then was just relate everything to what he already knew about rocks, and then learn those technical terms and, and just practice them. So that's kind of what my experience was with um, including Indigenous knowledge in education. And uh, when I started at ITEP four years ago, um, we were having a culture camp for our first year students, and then uh, our students were, were saying that's not enough. And I'm teaching classes um, at ITEP that deal with curriculum and methods of teaching the curriculum. And I noticed that when I ask students, okay, so this is like, this is the outcome. This is what your students are supposed to learn. Now how can you teach that through an indigenous lens? And a lot of them really struggled with that. And resource people, if, if you've grown up in the city, you don't have the same kind of resource people that you have, you know, if you grew up um, on the reserve. Or even if, like, if your reserve is not actively um, practicing culture and language, then you just don't have the resource people to be able to include Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous language when you're teaching. So I was finding that the three or four students who had a really strong background, they were fluent speakers and they were practicing their culture, those students were capable of, um, of doing the assignments, but their students that who just, they didn't have the resource people, they didn't have the background knowledge, they hadn't been brought up, they're non-speakers, and I'm asking them to, to uh, incorporate indigenous knowledge and language into their lessons and they just don't know where to go to get that. Um, so they're at, they were asking for more culture and more language, more, more opportunities for them to learn their language while they're in ITEP and more opportunity to learn cultural skills and to learn about ceremony and to take part in ceremony while they're in ITEP. And um, so we started having four culture camps per year, so that in in every year that you're in ITEP, you would you could take part in a, in a culture camp, um, and so that gave them about four full days with elders in four years. Um, what Chris didn't talk about is that uh, Think Indigenous Education Conference has been happening now since 2015. And that was um, an idea Chris had that that just grew. And uh, there's quite a few people involved now with Think Indigenous. And it's really growing. And by attending the Think Indigenous conference, I realized that there are a lot of resources out there for our students. But they don't have the they don't have um, the capability. They're you know they're living on a student budget and some of them don't have transportation or they they have to think about you know there are four kids that um, are in school here so they can't just up and go and go to a conference and um, stay away for four days so 
Uh, so we started to think about how can we bring that to our students and for free. Um, our students have the opportunity for professional development on, on Fridays because they don't have classes on Fridays. So we decided we would start holding uh, professional developments on Fridays. Now, we, we sat as a staff and we thought about what are the, what are the um, skills that are pretty common in all of the linguistic groups that we serve? Or, you know, what are the things that um, um, a lot of the communities would value from having teachers who could teach that in their classrooms? And uh, so we brainstormed a bunch, of, a bunch of ideas. And then last December we had an elders gathering. And we had um, SICC actually helped us to, um, to bring together some elders from all of the, the linguistic groups. And so... Uh, we sat with them and we talked, and, and one of the things they said is that language is like your first priority language needs to be um, at the top of the list, included in everything. Mm -hmm. So from, from the direction that the elders gave us, um, we started to work out a year plan of how we could include language and include culture for our students so that um, they had that opportunity while they're at university for four years, and how could we maximize more than, you know, more than just offering them four days in four years, how could we maximize their um, opportunity to participate? And so if we use every single Friday from September to April, we've got 18 days that we can uh, have PDs, so we can have 18 different kinds of themes done. But also, once a month, we also have just a specific Friday for language, and we do um, Cree and Nakawe, and uh, oh, said, <coughs> Dakota, Nakoda, and Dene. <laughs> and uh, so we, we have some resource people who come in there, they're teaching the language. And um, this is, we haven't made it mandatory for our students to attend these. These are all, they're, they're optional. They're, uh, the students that want to be there, go to them. So um, there have, we've seen kind of a pattern in interest. So uh, we've had medicine picking with uh, Glenda Abbott and Daffy Puya, and that one had a really high enrollment. <coughs> We had ribbon skirt making with um, Dabney Warren, and that one, well, we had a wait list for that one. And so we kind of, we're, we're seeing um, which one students are, are really interested in knowing how to teach for schools. Um, what else? Oh, oh, some of the feedback I had too from students, so we've had, a couple, a couple now. We started on September 6th, so we actually introduced it by teaching them about Indian control of Indian education, and and how that uh, policy document is a part of who they are going to be as teachers, um, because they chose the ITEP program, and that's what ITEP is all about. And so um, <coughs> that one had a pretty big attendance too, and they learned how to. Uh, to plan for the year using community um, resource people. And no matter what community they're in, they could go, they, know, they now know how to uh, reach out to the community. Um, trying to think of what else we had. Oh yeah. Yeah, so part of, part of how that, because has a uh, uh, handout, I guess. But part of what it is is that, so I was a so I was a school principal and a classroom teacher, and you know we do this land base. So land base is a really cool uh, keyword now. Like everybody's using this land based idea. You know, like uh, you want to put on uh, uh, an event and people come. So let's just call it land based, <laughs> and we'll show up. And then in second place, you know, quickly following behind is trauma informed practice. You know. 
Those are those are really cool things that you know people are talking about. There's keywords that happen, you know, as we go through. So these are things that we just shouldn't normally do anyway. Now, I'm sorry, I don't want, I don't mean to offend anybody, but if if you bring a moose to your schoolyard and some hunters from the reserve killed it and put it on the back of their truck and dumped it off and you and you skin it on your yard, that's not land-based education. That's Hunters, that's outfitters killing a moose and skinning it in front of you. You know, like uh, the land-based part of it is being actively engaged in all of that learning. Like, what is the traditional practice when you're hunting? What There's certain things that you do after you kill that bull moose that you are required as an Indian to do when you do those. You're missing out on everything and instead you get to see like the fun part of it, I guess, you know, or that, that piece. It's hard work, like the fun part when you're shooting it and then Jelen's running that class about, you know, 10 seconds. And then, uh, and then about, you know, six hours of work follows. And then you just ask your bro Pete to go and do that for you and bring me the nice packaged meat. That's the best way to hunt, by the way. Um, we're joking around again. but. We have to, we have wanted to rethink how we do that. So we wanted to try to provide PDs that spark people to know the difference between uh, an event and actually actively participating in land-based. Actively participating and being engaged in trauma-informed practice. Because the land-based is trauma-informed practice, it's decolonization, it's language revitalization, it's all connected. They're not just subjects or we can't separate them like they do in a school system. And, and that's what we do. Uh, language teachers. If you're a language teacher and you're, and you're in this room and it's the prep for all of the classroom teachers, you need to have a conversation with your principal. Our languages are not preps. Our teachers, our classroom teachers need to be in your classrooms learning language. Need to be. If you're a principal or a, a leader in your school, make the prep phys ed. Make the prep something else because it shouldn't be language. They actively participate. And as hard as it is for me to uplift my mother-in-law, no, just kidding, she's awesome. But she's a Cree language speaker and she says, no teacher is allowed to miss my class because if I'm not here or if I move somewhere else, these languages need to continue on with a method that works. So all of this whole process and the things that we do in our school are what we've based our PDs on. We want our students to know the difference of these different things. So the medicine picking, moss bag teaching. So who knows our teachings around moss bags? Who, who understands that when you put that cradle board in the ground and the little children that are watching the things that you're doing, how important that is to the development of the Indian mind. How important these teachings are to not be distracted and to be observant about the things around you. Those are all taught in our moss bags. And it's not only women that should know that. Our men and our fathers also need to understand those things. So we offer that type of PD, medicine picking, we think that medicine picking only can happen in the reserve at certain sacred areas. This whole land that we walk on is sacred. Every single thing that we do that's connected to the earth where something grows is a sacred part of, the, of what the Creator made for us. So medicine is everywhere. Our students went to the river just probably about a five minute walk from the College of Education in the city of Saskatoon, and they picked medicines that lower blood pressure, that made uh, tea, you know, that increased your uh, your sex drive. No, just kidding, I didn't do that. Sorry, Bronte, bro. Yeah, <laughs> just kidding. Your mom's just gunning me off over here. And it, but uh, we have all of these things within our within access to what we can get. So we created these pieces, uh, the ribbon skirts, weather and migration. You know, we we. How do we understand weather? How do we know it's going to be cold for a winter? How do we know how much snow is going to happen? 
We turn on uh, CTV News, we turn it on channel, channel six is real old, you know, only had two channels. <laughs> channel six and seven, <laughs> channel, and channel six was always fuzzy. Anyways, we, we turn on the weather and we expect that, or we open up our apps on our phones and it gives us the seven day forecast. We have Indian ways of understanding weather. So we provide those as just ideas for our students to connect. So, uh, and, and we'll never get it all, but just having the ability to access them, and I actively, I do my best and the staff do their best to actively show how you ask, okay? You gotta prepare yourself when you go and ask these knowledge keepers and these wisdom carriers, you have to prepare yourself to ask the right question. If I went to my, my relative in the back here, Peter, and I just, I didn't, wasn't prepared, and I just went up to him and asked him, you know, hey, how, what do you think of the Rough Riders? We'd sit in there, we'd talk about Saskatchewan Rough Riders and how much Mosaic cost, and I wouldn't get any Nakoda teachings. I wouldn't get any Nakoda language. I wouldn't know the words that are important for me to share with my son. So we need to prepare ourselves when we go and ask these elders. So we, we do that ahead of time so that when the people come in, they know what we're asking for. Um, another piece for, for, for us in this area is understanding nationhood, understanding treaty, understanding our relationship. We, so this is a little bit of my bias here, is we are not Canadians. If we're, if we're engaged as indigenous people original to this land, we, we predate Canada. We predate that. We're here way before that. This is our territory, this is our land that we're only sharing with, with, with the nation state of Canada. But our teachers and our, our people that are in our schools need to know that. You know, stop pretending to be minority Canadian citizens because you're not. You predate all of that. So we share those little, those, those pieces of teachings with our students because we're trying to disrupt an education system that's designed to kill us. Indigenous art is another, another form. So again, my relatives that, that's here, there, there's a historical art uh, artist that existed within my community of Carrie Kettle and, and my, my grandmother's cousin, his name was Johnny Hayway. He was a historian through indigenous art. How many of our people continue that on and our children in our schools are telling our stories through indigenous art? I was so proud of my young relative here, Bronte, and, and putting a story in, in the language and talking about that and what that means. He's representing and connecting to his blood memory of his indigenous art forms. So those of us that are sitting in this room that have this indigenous knowledge system, even though it's not from a university or a textbook, that knowledge is important and that's what we want to share to our students. Uh, and like indigenous dance, man, I hear and I see things on, on, on social media where young boys are cutting their hair and people are calling them girls and it, it bothers them. But we're not we, we sometimes we're not teaching those hair and body teachings. We're not teaching the, the, the significance of, of our hair and our braids and how powerful that is for our boys and what we do with that and the protocols that are along with that. Sometimes we don't teach them because we don't know as parents. So how will you ever know if you don't know how to ask or if you're raised in a city? Your alternative is to go and cut your hair. Man, we don't want to do that. We want to incorporate and get these kids to be proud of that. And, and, and this is our lived experience as well, is to just make sure that we offer those opportunities. Uh, regalia making. So this is a really a big... Uh, so growing up, like I said, I used to go get the soup and the tea for, for all of these elders that used to sit around or these these, uh, my, my grandmother's relatives in these different communities. One, they talk about different things. Number one, they talk about Indian names. They talk about whose Indian name was which and you know where it came from. They talk about how they were related to one another. 
like long discussions like, yeah, that's my cousin. This is how that's my cousin. And I'm just sitting there like, oh, okay, everyone's related. How am I supposed to snag? Anyways, <laughs> go north and degree. Anyways, the, the other thing that, we, that they would talk about, because we're always at powwows when, we were, when this, these visiting were happening, they talk about designs and, and their regalia and what the designs meant and how you can identify a Nakoda, how I can identify the different Asakan fox and, and the different designs that were on there. How many of our children know those teachings? How many of them know and understand the different berries and, that are represented in our regalia that they come from different areas? You know, like there's, there's certain berries that are drawn and there's different designs from northern Manitoba than there is from, from the Cypress Hills. You know, how do you identify those and what it is? So these are the things that we want to spark our teachers to think about. We're not giving them all that knowledge. We're just trying to share and give them a glimpse of it, I guess. Right? Um, I don't know. How, how long do we go for? What time is it? 2.37. So we have seven minutes, right? Do we? Okay, we have seven minutes. We have a pamphlet here. And we just want to, if anybody has any kind of questions to ask us, we didn't really go in detail about our PDs. And there's a reason for that. The PDs that we offer, they're specific to ITEP. In this uh, uh, melting, I guess a melting pot's a bad word, but we have all the different language groups in our program. It's specific to us. And, and we touch on all of these topics that we mentioned. They're, they'll be in that pamphlet and they're here. But really what's, what's the most important thing is it needs to be relevant to your communities. It needs to be for you. So what's the important thing for you? And the, the only question you need to ask your community members and the people and the elders in your community is what do you want your children to know when we're gone from this earth? Do you want them to be what uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau said? That if you don't speak your language, you don't have a culture. What do we want for our children? If there's no land base. So we have to just think about those and how do we incorporate that within our own communities. Um, so. I'll, I'll stop there. I don't know if Miko had to add anything else. Our PDs are open for people to come and attend. Um, so Think Indigenous, I'm going to do a plug for the conference. So Think Indigenous uh, International Education Conference is happening March 11, 12, and 13 in Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, last year the conference sold out at 1,200 people and there was 500 people on a waiting list. So don't be like Indian and wait till the last minute and phone me saying, bro, get me in there. Like I had how many calls? Ivan, where's Ivan? He asked me that damn question. He's sitting in the back. Bro, hook me up. Yeah. Okay, so I let him come, you know. Yeah, so. But, but what, we've, what we've done with that is that 100% of whatever we, whatever we make from that, we don't take money from the feds, INAC, no dollars come from INAC, no dollars come from water or land destroying entities like oil and gas. So the only way that we make money is through registration costs. And 100% of those registration costs go back to supporting our, our kids and our, and our schools through indigenous initiatives. So last year, uh, like this year starting up, I, start, I started up with a really small amount of money but that's an Indian way of doing it because I believe that if we give this back in a good way, it's going to come back to us. And we're in year we're in year six, and the 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 result is just phenomenal. And that's with no funding. And we get to say what we want, and we get to do what we want, and nobody tells us any different. And that's good for me because <laughs> I need that kind of. Uh, I'm scared, you know, speaking on behalf of these guys here, saying something wrong, you know. But so I'm careful. Imagine me not being careful. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what you get at Think Indigenous. But I want to invite you to there. 
And part of what we do is that that's what funds these PDs for our ITEP students. So the honorariums that come in for our elders, I told you it's difficult working in institutions. They get taxed, elders that come to our, uh, come to our schools, they get taxed. And if you make, if you come over at the $500, it's dollar for dollar that you get taxed. And it also affects your old age pension. And essentially at tax time, our elders are paying to come and share knowledge with us. I'm sorry, but that's bullshit. So what we've done is we found a loophole and think indigenous pays them and they don't do any taxes. So yeah, I know that's a big deal. That's a big deal. These institutions want you guys to be there and work with them, but they want you to pay to be there. Or else they're asking you, you, you come in and share, and in two weeks time you'll get paid. Money and the concept of money is different for us. It, we're not paying for a service, what we're doing is we're feeding you and your family. We're thanking you for coming and sharing your knowledge with us, let me feed you in the best way that I know how. We don't have enough time to make a, a feast, we don't have enough time to make the soup, so we're going to give you money so that you can go and you can feed yourself, feed your horses, put gas in your vehicle. So that's the concept and idea of what we try to do. That's what we want our students to do and think about. And uh, you know, we're, we're doing our best. And they are open to people to attend if you so want to uh, attend the conference. I mean, attend the conference and the PD. All right? Stop there. If you want a pamphlet, you can come up and grab one. All right. Hey, hey.